Welcome everybody to this CNBC discussion on the future of banking at the World Economic Forum in Davos. I'm Jeff Cutmore. Let me introduce to you our very distinguished panel. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Brian Moynihan. Uh, Brian is the chairman and the CEO of Bank of America. And I'll just give you some fast facts. Uh, the stock has risen well over 30% since Donald Trump was elected on November the 8th. <laughs> uh, he's been very busy shedding businesses, I think up to 60 uh, in recent years. There is a relentless focus on costs at Bank of America. And just to give you a, a few quotes to let you know how Brian is feeling about things at the moment, on regulation, he said on CNBC, I'm interested in having a regulated system because we have to pay to clean up afterwards when things go wrong. He also described businesses as being somewhat friskier since Donald Trump came into office. Those are Brian's words, not mine. Uh, Brian Moynihan. Um, Antonio Horta uh, joins us. Antonio Horta Osario from the Lloyds Banking Group. Um, just to give you an idea as to what uh, he's been up to recently, um, in the middle of December, Lloyds splashed out on the US credit card business that I think Brian was pretty happy to sell them. Uh, the sum at $1.9 billion. But it represents something of a, a turning of the corner for Lloyds Bank, which has been somewhat on the naughty step since the global financial crisis and having to be bailed out by the UK government. Um, the bank continues, though, to set aside money for PPI compensation claims. Um, and if I say to you, uh, Lloyds has been... Um, very focused on rebuilding its operations as far as the UK retail client is concerned. Lloyd's has also not been slow in thinking about what to do post-Brexit. Plenty of reports suggesting that you've been looking at subsidiaries elsewhere in Europe. But as I, but, but as I understand it, no official confirmation yet from the bank. So we'll, we'll see how we do today. Yeah, that is the, correct. That is Just to confirm, we're very pleased to buy Brian's business as he was pleased. So to. you're not going to confirm <laughs> for us that you're currently looking at subsidiaries in Europe? Well, we are looking at them. That we have confirmed we are looking at it. OK. We have a small presence in Europe. Our business is 97% UK focused. But in terms of our European operations, which represent around 2% of what we do, we'll have to probably consider a subsidiary there to have access to payment systems and, and business throughout Europe, but at a scale which is 2% of Lloyd's as a whole. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're going to come back. We're going to talk a lot more about Brexit uh, on this panel. Sergio Armotti is with us uh, from UBS. He's been CEO over there since uh, 2011. Uh, he said here, 2017 will be a very challenging year for Europe due to Brexit and a range of elections due on the continental European mainland. Uh, perhaps controversially for the central bankers among us, he says low interest rates in Europe are fueling inequality. And uh, just a little bit of trivia, um, he took the ice bucket challenge back in 2014. So if you want to see what it sounds like when a leading banker has cold icy water poured over them, uh, you may go to that clip, which you will find on the web. I may mention YouTube. Interestingly, when I looked at that clip, it sat beside a presentation on responsible leadership, which also involved you. By coincidence. <laughs> so, very eclectic. Um, UBS has about 5,000 employees in London, uh, and I believe your chairman, Mr. Weber, has said there is possibly uh, a, a thousand employees that would be affected by Brexit. Correct. I mean, I mean it, it all depends how this uh, negotiation will play out. Uh, you know, it's uh, at least 26 months to go is uh, a lot of time. So we will find out exactly how to position, how to respond. We are, we are well prepared. OK, um, let's move on. Uh, Mary Callahan uh, dose joins us, the CEO of JP Morgan Asset Management. Welcome. Um, let's give you a few lines here. Um, at Delivering Alpha back in September, she said, investors are still afraid of what happened in 2008, and a lot of them are still sat in cash. Well, we've seen markets move, obviously. So, so that was September. We'll talk a bit about what's happening here. Um, in terms of uh, how her business is doing, JP Morgan results were just out. Net income in the asset management unit uh, run by Mary rose 16%. 
So I think things are just going fine over there right now. Um, and we actually did, a, a, I think, a, a story with you about the secret of your success or how one can become more successful. And the line here, no one thing better than anybody else, which I think is a, a very good piece of advice. Mary, thank you uh, for joining us on the panel. Um, and let me finish by introducing Andre Kostin, the president and chairman of VTB Bank in Russia. Um, he has said, uh, we will cut headcount in London only if there is a good business case. It's not a political decision, only if there is a good business case. He's very enthusiastic about Mr. Trump. Uh, we expect Trump to begin easing sanctions on Russia this year. VTB, of course, is still under sanctions, I believe, as a, as a government-owned bank. Um, he's recently been drawn into some debate, I think, about the funding role of VTB around Rozhneft and the sale of the Rozhneft stake. But um, I don't know whether you're aware, Mr. Kostin, uh, who's been the VTB boss since 2008, is a, uh, 2002, is a former diplomat. So I think he's been using his diplomatic skills to tamp down some of the controversy, perhaps, around that Rozhneft story. Um, and just to point out, the Russian economy is expected to grow possibly 1.5% this year, according to the World Bank. So <coughs> banking is probably not a bad place to be um, if we get that growth. So that's our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me just... Um, make a few introductory remarks. You know, the human brain is a remarkable organ. Our capacity to overcome pain and forgive and forget is quite remarkable. If you think about um, why women go on and have more than one child, phenomenal. The pain of childbirth quickly forgotten. As a passionate supporter of the English cricket team, I understand pain and how quickly one can move on. And I guess until very recently, um, those of you who are fans of the Chicago Cubs have known a lot about pain over the years, but fortunately that appears to be resolved. And that brings me on to the banking sector because it's, what, nearly a decade, I guess, since we had the global financial crisis. And yet in some quarters of the world, people haven't forgiven or forgotten. And there is still unfinished business it seems to me, when it comes to regulation in some parts of the world. And those legacy issues still tend to dominate for some banks in some parts of the world. But others seem to be doing OK. And I think Trump appears to be a catalyst. People are having another look. They're getting friskier, I think, as Brian might say. And they're getting more interested in capex rather than just opex at a business level. So let me start by just getting some views from the panel about the reality of Trump versus the 144 characters or whatever on his Twitter feed. I mean, let me just throw this out here. Who really thinks that Trump is going to make a meaningful, short, medium, and long-term difference to the prospects for the global banking industry. Brian, I may start with you, since you've been most vocal on the topic. Well, when we, uh, so we think about the role a bank plays, um, or whatever countries that we have, big home countries or globally in the world, you're gonna be driven by your economies. And so what, what drives the economy is a lot of things, but one of the things is confidence. And so you've already seen after the election a surge in uh, consumer confidence that uh, you saw a surge in small business confidence. and so. All that is really saying to you that the population that, you know, that has a lot to do with the U.S. economy, two-thirds driven by the consumer, and obviously small, medium-sized businesses are much more confident. Now the question is what will happen next, and we'll find out starting tomorrow, and, and you know, there'll be a series of policies and a lot of discussion, tax reform, and you know, you know, change in the Affordable Care Act in the United States, and all the different dialogues. But the, the thing that has happened that has you know, been reflected in the market is confidence has moved positively. And we've got to remember for a mid-sized company that's privately owned or et cetera, you know, their decisioning is based on what they think. And so that therefore they can not hire if they're worried and they can hire if they're not worried, irrespective of 2% growth 
being the, the constant between the two decisions. And so <coughs> what we see is they're borrowing a little bit more on the lines, and they're saying they're going to hire more people, and we'll see it play out. And it hasn't hurt your stock at all, has it? Let's be honest about I thought this. It, so, I so, thought it was good management. I mean, I mean, look, there are a lot of investors. Yeah, absolutely. But um, there are a lot of investors in this room right. who uh, are wondering why that good management wasn't reflected earlier in your share price um, running up <coughs> to November the 8th. But um, aside from that, you know, a lot of investors are looking at the banking sector and they still see value, they think. Um, do you think there is the potential for a lot more re-rating, not only of American banks, but banks globally, if what you're saying comes to pass? Well, if, if the rate structure rises, it's a very tough environment with a low rate structure we've had for you know, six, seven years now to run a financial institution because part of the business model is the value of, of the uh, cost of funds advantage you get from non-interest uh, bearing deposits and stuff. So as rates rise, that helps. People believe growth is going to come uh, stronger. We believe the United States are going to grow over 2% next year versus this year will end a little, you know, below 2%. That's good. And then, you know, then frankly, you know, the massive change that's going on is one of the themes of Davos here, which is the digital transformation of these companies is allowing us to become more and more efficient. And that put together gives us a rise in earnings. We made $18 billion after tax in 16. And uh, we're up, I don't know, 10, 13 percent uh, in the fourth quarter, last year's fourth quarter. Those are good statistics, so people see that coming through. Mary, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I just if you step back and you think about how the U.S. government has run, it's, it, yes, there's the president of the United States of America, but there's an entire government body that works on how the economy works. And if you think about the past 100 years of the way that the government has been run, roughly 40 to 50 percent of people in cabinet positions and above have been from business. And when you think about the past eight years, less than 10% of the people running the government have had business experience. So now when you think about what we're about to enter in here, it's going to be at least 50%. You look at the people that we've got already up for cabinet positions. And so you've got a pendulum switch here. And it's going to be positive for business. It just is. There's going to be lots of ups and downs. There's going to be lots of volatility. It's going to be very positive for businesses in the US, which should cascade to businesses around the world. And you're going to see that lifted in every sector. Banking is, is a microcosm of that. And it gets to participate in each and every one of those. And so that's why it's such an exciting sector to talk about. And it's going to be a great several years, not without its ups and downs. But you're going to see the US economy take off in a pro-business way that it hasn't in, in, in several years. And just on the, on the other aspect of the Jekyll and Hyde nature of the policy platform so far, cross-border lending has collapsed since the global financial crisis. That reflects what's going on in the banking sector. But the other you know, negative side, perhaps, to the Trump message for a lot of people here in Davos has been around trade protection and the turning back of the, the stream of globalization. Do you think that that's really going to happen, or was that just part of the populist appeal to get him over the line? I'm, I don't think anybody really knows. Um, but we are a global society, and we, do, we are interconnected with one another, and that's not going to go away. And when you talk about cross-border lending collapsing, it, it's not that banks didn't want to lend money. We have had a series of regulations causing us to all have increased capital. We have twice the amount of capital that we've had prior to the crisis. We have three times the amount of liquidity. We've got stress tests every week. We've got you know $9 billion that JP Morgan spends on controls within our company. We have 43,000 people, 43,000 people that work on controlling the risk, the safety, and the soundness of our bank. And so there's just a lot of focus that has been on the regulatory nature of, of making sure that we have safety and soundness, but perhaps at, at, the, at the sacrifice of growth. And that's cascaded across you know, every single one of these banks you see up here representing the global just, nature. Just very briefly, you've said that short-term risks uh, or, or a short-term approach to risk-taking sort of undermines everything. But that's been very much the nature of our marketplace recently. And the trend reversals we, we saw in the market through 2016 were remarkable. Do you think that people are going to be able, finally, to kind of lift their heads up and look a bit further out? I mean, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a, there's a shock to the system as to what's happening. There's a lot of uncertainty as to whether the words and the tweets are the you know, reality or just the, um, the art of the deal, if 
you read the book, you'll see that it's a lot of, of posturing and then, and then very serious negotiation thereafter. And so, I mean, I think, I think you're just going to have a lot of excitement, a lot of change, and there might be a little bit of Stockholm Syndrome going on here, which is all of us are sort of used to the way it's been for the past eight years, and we're going to have to get used to going back to, to thinking very proactively and, and getting excited about growth. Animal spirits unleashed once again. And yet, Sergio Amotti, those of us who do our trade in Europe look at the ECB meeting we're going to have today, and we kind of scratch our heads because, as you've pointed out, low rates are making it very difficult to turn a buck or a euro <coughs> in um, the eurozone. Um, do you think it's time for our own central bank in Europe to get with the game, start talking more actively and vocally about tapering, and just point out that there is a big opportunity out there that, quite frankly, people like Brian and others are coming over to take? Yeah, maybe just to uh, quickly add on uh, every, everything that uh, Mary just mentioned is that it's not just only the amount of capital we need to hold and the liquidity, is that that liquidity is not fungible cross-border because more and more we are asked to keep uh, capital and liquidity in a very nationalistic uh, way. So uh, basically uh, the fact of promoting lack of uh, internationalization uh, even when uh, it's totally uh, viable and uh, sustainable. So that's only a point. Well, it's yes. also being used for US settlements, of course. Why not? But that that's not right. to, has nothing to do with the way we are regulated and we have to run our liquidity ratios and our capital ratios. Is that there is a, a view that while uh, you know, um, there are rules like Basel and uh, core colleges and, and people talking uh, constantly together between regulators, the trust between themselves is not as high as uh, one would have expected in order to facilitate 10 years after the crisis, uh, you know, a, a more constructive approach to the benefits of international capital markets and, 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 and liquidity. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, you know, when I look at uh, why there is this uh, uh, also constructive, uh, let's call it that way, approach to uh, the, uh, uh, the election of, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, uh, Trump uh, is that in the back of the human mind, as you mentioned before, there is, there is a need, a desire to think positively. Mm -hmm. And you saw that coming out in very few ways. Now, the, the truth of the matter is that we will need to see if uh, it delivers <coughs> mm. uh, or, or if it's just an, yet another false uh, uh, positive uh, event. Now, back to your question, I think that's uh, yes. Uh, you know, the real the question that is, is how do we hopefully uh, see the ECB or even in Japan or the Swiss national banks uh, uh, that have uh, uh, zero or negative rates uh, policies uh, uh, not to, to take advantage of a potential Fed uh, uh, hiking mode and keeping the differential uh, uh, as it is today instead of uh, trying to, uh, you know, particularly for the Eurozone, uh, promote a further devaluation of the euro and a short-term gain in terms of the attractiveness of Europe in terms of its export. We all know that this is not the medicine for Europe. Europe needs more structural reforms to get into a sustainable framework to be competitive. So short-term monetary policy, it was an acceptable uh, response to, to the crisis. Uh, somehow close to what the Fed did, although we don't have a fiscal system in Europe, we don't have a, uh, such a clarity also on the political front, and therefore that tool has exhausted its validity and is creating too many side uh, problems that needs to be tackled, and I would absolutely uh, welcome any decision to start to normalize. Well, let's cut to the chase here, Sergio. I mean, you've described this as a perfect storm and it's hurting Swiss customers. Um, the um, BIS put out a paper uh, recently, 606, if you want to go and look at it, called Market Volatility, Monetary Policy, and Term Premium. And in that, they suggest that the evidence demonstrates there's no <coughs> statistically, I'll quote here, statistically significant real impact despite having a sizable negative effect on the term premium of unconventional monetary policy post-crisis. Now, that's a shocker to me. But if that's the case, 
and we're here to talk about responsive leadership, do we need the politicians or the central bankers to start changing their attitude and their view on how the economy is run? I mean, which is it? Who needs to snap out of it and get real with the program? I, I think that the central bankers already did more than enough to be part. The central banker are, should focus to uh, have, you know, basically facilitate a phase into a new political you know, uh, model or desire to transform the economy. And therefore, uh, it's all then welcome to be very expansive in a moment in which you need to go through structural reforms. But you need to have the structural reform, reform first. You can't basically allow uh, politicians to go on and ask for more uh, central bank intervention in order to address these issues. I mean, actually, it's now crystal clear that it's not working any longer. Yeah. Antonio, let's, let's come to you. I mean, we, we've had a similar experience in the UK <coughs> with rates, but we seem to be getting some momentum back in the UK story. But let me use this as an opportunity, perhaps, to bridge to Brexit. Um, Trump and Brexit are a couple of issues that the markets are thinking about differently. Um, give, us, give us your line, then on the UK and Brexit. Yeah, sure, pleasure. Just before we go in, just to add on what uh, Sergio and Mary just said, mm. I think when you look uh, from the crisis into today, the biggest changes you had in the last 10 years were clearly, as was said, more regulation in general and more capital in particular. So as a consequence, banks had to do three things. First, to prune less profitable activities, which were exposed by the additional capital. Mm. Second, reduce the number of jurisdictions because of the first point, mm. and also because of not having the burden of those multiple evolutions of regulation and different conduct approaches. And thirdly, they had to focus on where they had comparative advantages because of the first two points, big changes. Now, with President-elect Trump, you have more optimism. I think that's positive. He wants banks to have a bigger say in, in economic growth, and I fundamentally think that is an inextricably linked combination. You don't have strong economies in the long run without strong banks and vice versa. Banks are for the economies like the blood is for, is for the body. And therefore, I think I see, I see that as very positive. When you look longer term, I think that contrary to these trends of the past, the two most important trends that will shape banking in the next 10 years are the interest rate level. And we go back to Sergio's point. Mm. Now, especially in Europe, Half of the balance sheets of banks, especially retail and commercial banks, is a bit useless if you want because margins are compressed and deposits are not useful, economically speaking. Mm. And secondly, digital fintech is a major trend shaping the future. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves, right? Because we're going to so come these to are, fintech. These later. are more long term important trends. So, Brexit. To your question about Brexit, Brexit is obviously a very important uh, issue in terms of the UK. The UK has a preeminent position in financial markets. It has all the conditions to continue to do so, you know, time zone, language attraction of talent, infrastructure. And uh, as was said before, depending on how this deal is negotiated, you will have more or less implications. I think the Prime Minister was very clear yesterday about what type of deal she wants. And now we have to see how this is implemented in a way which is a win-win for both Europe and the UK, as she said and not a lose-lose situation. But it's very but disappointing. There are significant hiccups ahead. Let's see how this is played out. Yeah, but it's very disappointing, isn't it, that um, the City of London makes up such a significant contribution to GDP growth, and yet I heard nothing in her speech yesterday um, about passporting, about special pleadings for the financial industry. Um, I mean, I know sometimes politicians feel it's an inconvenient truth, that financial services is terribly important to the UK, but it is. Well, uh, Aren't you disappointed? No, I actually disagree. I mean, I think uh, <coughs> she said or she implied, and the briefing was in that direction, that some sectors like manufacturing, automotive, as she said, and financial services would have to have a special focus. She wants a free trade deal, free trade and service deal, and that is the way where some sectors can keep a, a preeminent position. Mm. And I think she's clearly focused as I told you, both, for example, in automotives and the financial sector. Financial sector in the UK represents 8% of GDP, is one of the largest sectors. Yes. And it is a key competitive advantage of Britain. And it is obvious that the government will have to focus a lot on keeping that competitive advantage. Look, um, the FCA 
figures say 5,000 companies in the UK have at least one passport to give them business operations into the single market. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty significant. I mean, Brian, you must be rubbing your hands here because anything that stops UK businesses taking advantage of the single market is an opportunity for the American bankers, isn't it? Yes and no. Yeah, uh, you know, the competitive set that we all have among ourselves is heavy, but you know, all of us have major operations in London that we're dealing with the same issues and the uncertainty about it. And I think, you know, it, this is unprecedented, obviously. And mm. So, you know, everybody wants to know, are you going to move six people here or seven people? We don't know yet because we don't know the rules, so there's a lot of speculation. But I think that the, the lack of a of unified capital markets in the European context is one of the reasons why Mary and our, Mary's company and my, our company, our two companies have made a lot of progress because we were able to shed the assets, we were able to raise the capital. People have to remember to the point about the synergy between the banks and the economy, it's also the bank's capital markets and the economy. And any time you divide that in pieces, it's not as effective. And it hadn't yet developed. And so I get more worried about the structural help for Europe because if the European economy does well, Bank of America is going to do well in our, capital, our corporate investment banking and our capital markets. And I think any time you divide things in two, they're a little less efficient, a little less investment, a little less certainty, and you start to do it. And if you want to have your roadmap to that, look at the rest of the world that divides it in pieces, and it's not as effective. So I, I think what the prime minister will try to accomplish is some, something that she, you know, she just talked about. But it'll be a, it'll be a tough sled, and, and so we got to wait till they figure it out, and then we'll figure out what to do. Andre, let's come to you here. Um, You've been very enthusiastic about what you think Donald Trump is going to bring. And of course, in the context of the frozen relations between Moscow and Washington, perhaps that's not surprising. But just share with us, what, what do you think, in banking terms, the real opportunity for a Russian bank currently under sanctions is? First of all, I would like to underline one unfairness, because you mentioned in your opening remarks that a result of the election of Mr. Trump, the stocks of the major American banks like uh, Bank of America and JP Morgan grew by 25, 30%. Though most of the people from, from Wall Street were supporting Mr. Hillary Clinton. You also believe in America that Russia helps Mr. Trump to get the job, but our stocks are not growing. <laughs> That's, I think, absolutely <laughs> not right. <laughs> so I think to compensate this, to eliminate this inequality, I think Mr. Trump should remove sanctions against the leading, four leading Russian banks. Yes. That will help a lot for us. For, from, first of all, from the point of view of further privatization, we can't privatize any further because of these um, um, sanctions. We can't borrow in the West because of the sanctions, and it's no good, I think. So we definitely very much believe that, from what Mr. Trump said, that he would have a much more constructive dialogue with Russia on, on international affairs as well as on bilateral. And as a part of this, uh, I expect that the first sanctions to fall could be uh, sanctions against uh, leading Russian financial institutions. Mm. Could be very helpful. It's, it didn't kill us. We, we're still working, we're still making profit in Russia. But of course, that's um, very much uh, make our future uh, not as bright as we expected when in 2007 and then in 2011, I think when Brian uh, was placing our stocks in, in, in America, that was quite, quite a, a good um, transaction. But now, nowadays it's quite difficult because of the sanctions. Yeah, well, I understand uh, your comment about helping uh, uh, Mr. Putin, helping Mr. Trump. Uh, with his election campaign, but what about Mr. That's what you believe. In. Well, no, that's that's that's, <laughs> that's what you I'm just said. CNBC. That's what you just said. Watching. We certainly didn't say that. I don't think on CNBC. Oh, sorry. Well, CNN. I, I certainly CNN. Didn't. Sorry, no, no fake. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing, though. Isn't hey, it? <laughs> it's not my job to deny anything nah. you say about the opposition. Okay. So we'll move on. Um, but I do want to make a point here about you know Mr. Putin helping Mr. Putin or helping himself because. I go into Russia a lot, and interest rates in Russia are at 10%. The inflation rate's a little over 5%, and the central bank governor is aiming for 4%. Now, to me, that suggests there's quite a lot of headroom to bring rates down. But you know that Elvira Nabulina says it's not going to happen until the country engages in proper structural reform. And quite frankly, that would also be good news for the banking system. So do you think Mr. Putin actually needs to get on with a doing a bit more of the harder work around restructuring the economy and perhaps freeing up a bit more capital, some more loan growth. 
Well, you know, I'm always criticizing the central bank for, for the higher interest rate, but women, they do, they're very cautious, you know, they, they prefer to, to make uh, smaller steps. And um, if we take um, uh, inflation, for example, there is a, we consider it a historical achievement that last year we had 5.4% inflation, and next year, or well, sorry, this year already, the target is 4%, and our estimation is probably 3.8, 3 which will, for, will be quite unique for Russia. We, we just a few years ago, we, we had double-digit inflation. And so from this point of view, there are certain achievements in macroeconomics uh, which, for which the central bank is uh, praising you know, for, for these results. Mm. Uh, and, I, and we expect that, that the interest rate will, will go down to 8, maybe 8 and half percent uh, later this year. But uh, yes, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, uh, we should do more uh, um, to restructure the Russian economy, though um, structural reforms is, is not only applied to Russia, probably there's a lot of discussions here uh, that uh, in many parts of the world uh, the structural reforms are needed, including the subject we discussed today, what to do with the banking sector. Uh, so yes, uh, our Russian banking very much depends on what's going to happen in Russia, of course, definitely, but we also, um, very much, we became, the Russian making sector from the very beginning uh, was building up as a, as a part of international uh, financial system and we very much welcomed the, participant, uh, the participation of American banks, you know, the, uh, all the investment banks were uh, very active in Russia and Citibank is doing very well in Russia in retail. So we consider ourselves as a part uh, of the international system as a result of the sanctions. We started to invent um, some um, domestic things like domestic credit cards and other things things because to defend, to defend our own system, which, which yeah. we don't think is necessary if we have a good uh, relationship uh, as a global system. Mm -hmm. So yes, we should do uh, our work, uh, of course, and we'll be talking about this later in Davos, but uh, for us to have an open financial system when we can be part of this and enjoy all the privileges of global, it's very, very important. I want to move on to, to business models and talk about which business lines might really thrive going forward. But I think a critical part of that story um, lies partly in what happens around regulation from here. And we know there's, there's some pushback on, on Dodd-Frank and Volcker in the US. And we also know there's a lot of nervousness around what Basel IV brings in terms of um, capital requirements. Um, so I'd just like to do something here and, and get you involved as well. Can I ask you to put up your hands if you think Donald Trump will push back Dodd-Frank banking regulation in the United States once he's pre president. If you could raise your hands if you think he will make changes to allow banks to go back into some areas of the market that they've been absent from. Please, please put your hands up if you think that's going to happen. And please, on the panel, if you could put your hands up if you think Dodd-Frank is gonna change as a result of Donald Trump. You do, you do. So probably, what, I think, Sergio, no, you don't? No. But you're the only one here that, who doesn't think that's going to happen. Yeah. And largely, put your hands back up in the audience, if you could. OK, it's, it's mixed, not too certain. OK, fine. And, and Basel IV, slightly more complicated, because you've got to read into the rules a little bit. But just to tell you, every European banker is terrified about the strict terms of, of some of the consulting that's already been done being imposed as far as Basel IV is concerned on capital levels. Please put your hand up if you think there's going to be any softening around Basel IV ultimately when it's implemented because it's holding back European banking profitability and growth. Please put your hands up. Okay. Uh, less certainty, I think, that there will be changes. Um, yeah. Oh, less certainty. So... Um, I spoke with Jess Staley uh, earlier on um, from, from Barclays, and, and his view was um, Dodd-Frank and Volcker, nothing's going to change. Basel IV will get softened because ultimately the Europeans will be crazy not to make it happen. Sergio, do you think that's how it's going to play? Absolutely. And if so, how do we get that message across to the politicians? Well, first of all, I, I think that w when you look at uh, the reason, the reason why I don't believe that uh, um, Dodd Frank and Volcker rule will be massively uh, diluted is because the vast majority of it is correct. It's something that we needed to see happening globally in terms of uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis. So maybe at the margins, some uh, intended or unintended consequences of those legislation will be somehow uh, addressed with a more pragmatic uh, uh, approach also on how to implement them. Uh, when, and, and, but at the end of the day, I think that the US system has been already reorganized around that. 
I don't think it's up to Brian and, uh, and Mary to talk about that, but I don't see also a lot of incentive, particularly by the big banks, to let that happen because it's also now become a pretty interesting competitive advantage they have. So uh, on Basel IV, on Basel IV, for the reason Brian mentioned before, uh, you know, the, the, the capital market system and the function of uh, European banks uh, and Asian banks to their economy is fundamentally different. I'm embracing this evolution, what, you know, basically uh, the Bas Basel co uh, Committee, they call it a finalization of Basel III, the industry, and now more and more, some regulators and politicians are recognizing that it's de facto Basel IV, i.e., a substantial increase in capital requirements for banks that makes absolutely no sense compared to the functions and the needs after the fact that we have eight times to 10 times more capital than before the crisis and our functions to the economy is completely different. That's the reason why it needs to be pushed back because there is not such a standard that is applicable across the board and and, 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 uh, and we have to stop this notion that more capital is just better. It's just it's the quality of regulation that is, uh, is focused. And, 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 and to close, the welcome news is that it is re European regulation, regulators, the main regulators, and politicians that have realized that, which in my point of view was an ultimate success. Because once you get people to recognize their merits, that they had merits in re-regulating the industry. But inevitably, when you do all these changes so quickly, you make mistakes. And the realization right now at the last minute that maybe we are going too far, it's the best news we could have ever seen. But not for banks, for the economy in Europe. Because for the reason we mentioned before, there's no way you can have banks uh, contributing to the best developments in Europe without having a fair, balanced regulatory framework. Mary. I, you know, the, the, the question of Basel IV and Volcker, and everybody just wants fairness, right? And everyone wants a level playing field. And so you've got everyone up here will have a different opinion as to where they sit, as to where they stand. And when you look at just regulations in general, they start with the premise of they're trying to make things better. Right? Safety and soundness. Let's not go through what we went through in 2008. And most of them have actually accomplished that. But when you look at regulations in, after they sort of balloon themselves, Dodd-Frank itself has 25,000 line items that we have to follow, 25,000 restrictions that you have to follow on a daily basis. If you look at regulations in general in the United States of America over the past eight years, there have been 256 <coughs> regulations that have caused $100 million or more of cost to the US economy, 256. 229 of them have been negative for each of those sectors. And, and they're regulated by you know, CFTC, F SEC, Fed, OCC, Health and Human Services, Department of Energy, Department of Labor. And you go through, we're, we're a bank, we're one institution, we operate in 100 countries. We have 250 regulators. On Dodd-Frank alone, one rule. We have five regulators for one rule. So it's not that the rule was intended to be bad. It was intended to do all the right things. It's just that we have gone on for eight years, and, we, and we're still not even done, and we're still working through harmonizing it globally. We have got to stop. We have got to take out the things. We're asking a lot of the European companies have been asked to talk about, you know, give me proof as to what, what has worked and what hasn't. That's a great exercise. We should do that globally. We should take off the things that are stopping business growth, and then we should just move forward. We've done enough. We've got it in a good place. The safety and soundness of each and one of these institutions that are standing up here represented and the ones that aren't are making the economy in a much better place so that we can continue to go back and grow. And that's what and we need I, to focus I, on. But I talked a little bit about pain and forgiveness at the beginning of the program. And you know there'll be people watching this program who are shouting at the TV right now and saying, hell yeah, hell yeah, because we had TARP, because we had trillions of dollars that bailed out the global economy in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008. Absolutely, they hear what you say. But is there a better way that we could have done it without putting all these additional costs and these line items on the banks? 
Because clearly, mm -hmm. you know, if you have to spend the money there, that's not money you're lending out to grow a small business or to help someone um, buy a more, you know, get a mortgage to buy a house. So, I mean, is there a better way? Well, that's the point. I mean, we have to figure out all the trapped liquidity. And if you just took all the trapped liquidity that sat up here represented by these institutions and put it out in the lending community and had the multiplication effect of that, you'd raise global, global GDP. Mm. Um, Antonio. Yeah. I think you put exactly the right question. I mean, re relating to Basel, I basically think that... Let's uh, hope my boss is watching this. No, no, absolutely the right well question. Done. Because Basel, as the regulator yeah. said, should not provide significant capital increases. So, as we all are saying here, that should be delivered. And I think that the French and German banks, in particular, are very mindful of this thing being a reality. Because, as you said, mm. they don't want, and in Europe that is more much more preeminent than in the States. They don't want their support to the real economy in terms of providing, for example, mortgages mm -hmm. or lending to SMEs to be significantly affected. So your question goes to the corner of this process. Mm -hmm. We don't want any of us ever again taxpayers' money to bail out banks. So we want banks to be very safe. But as you said, we don't want to interrupt the credit flow to the economy and the proper support to the economy. So what else beyond ever rising capital increases can be used. And there are three very important things. First, more assertive supervision, which regulators have been doing since the crisis, that is done. Second, much more, much stronger liquidity levels, which as Mary said, are a reality. For example, in Lloyd's case, Lloyd's had 300 billion pounds of debt six years ago. Now it has only 100. And on the other side of the balance sheet, we have 100 billion pounds of guilt, so net zero debt. And thirdly, very important, the resolution plans, of which ring fencing in the UK is a key part in the measure that it exempts, exempts separates investment banks from retail banks, and therefore provides a much better resolution if, for example, the investment bank is into problems. And therefore, if you have good resolution plans, if you have more liquidity as you already do, and more assertive supervision, you don't require ever rising capital levels, which would damage the credit flow into the economy. Um, I want to move on, because we've only got about 20 minutes left, and I want to get FinTech in and some other disruptors if I can. But just very briefly, I mean, I, there is no one perfect bank model. So much of it depends on where you're located and what your customer base looks like and so on and so forth. But it would be useful, I think, if you could just briefly share with us as a panel some ideas about what are going to be good growth drivers in the industry in 2017, 2018, you know, as we begin to, what seems to be clear, emerge from the very sclerotic rates of growth we've seen up to this point, effectively, since the financial crisis. So very quickly. So the, uh, the, the universal model of having retail banking, commercial banking, wealth management, and uh, capital markets and investment banking, yeah, we obviously firmly believe in, it's how we run the company because the integration between our research uh, platform and what they come up with and how we use it in a wealth management business or institutional businesses you know, is helpful. The insights you get, the scale and technology, scale for cybersecurity defense, you know, the ability to drive costs down through scale and then give it to the consumers and by lowering their costs. You know, these are big benefits that go through to society. So we, we believe that model works. There'll be other models. There'll be big banks, there'll be small banks. There have been for a long time. There'll be Specialized institutions, there'll be institutions of more general import. But you know, I believe the universal model is what the large, large economies need at some point because of the, of the ability to arrange a loan that JP and ourselves can arrange. You can't do it with 100 banks out there at $100 million a piece. You have to have a couple of big banks come in and take it so the real economy can turn at the size and scale and scope it is. So we believe in the integrated model, um, and it will be, and the growth will be along all those dimensions. Every one of those businesses you grow, even in a 2% growth rate, there's opportunities, there's general economic growth, there's competitiveness, and, and we'll drive them forward. O open floor. Who wants to jump in? Just well, w one of the reasons why we had uh, such a uh, devastating outcome from the financial crisis is that was, you know, for the, the previous 15 to 20 years, uh, banks in general of any size, e even in the continent here in Europe, uh, had, uh, had global ambitions um, across the board, you know, uh, across the, the business lines Brian just mentioned, but also in, in, from a geographic standpoint of view. And that has created uh, this idea that in order to be competitive, you need to do everything everywhere to everybody. Now, from my standpoint of view, it's now clear that, you know, 
uh, while we share the same banking license, we can't be all the same. Because the history and the DNA and the client base we have is different, and the way that we operate is different. So from, from our experience is that we had to rethink about certain aspect of uh, who we are without compromising uh, global ambition. So that's the reason, for example, we see ourselves as a global specialist, i.e. a global franchise in wealth management, uh, a universal capabilities in a small country like Switzerland, and then we have selective, you know, competitive positions in other areas that are complementary to a uh, to, to, to a integrated business model where applicable. But if you try to be competitive across the board everywhere, you're just going to repeat exactly what happened. So it's very fundamental for the banking system to understand their DNA, their client needs, and and, and, and adapt and, and live with that. So big banks, global banks, uh, and, and small banks need, needs to coexist. Personally, I think that the ability, and even uh, you, you see it also the big U, uh, US banks, the ability to do retail bank everywhere in the world, for example, mm. it's almost impossible. But know? I, know, I, I know that you have said that the US and China represent your big growth opportunities going yes. forward, and yet you're a Swiss bank with a big domestic yeah. banking business. So there's no growth in Europe anymore? Well, well no, not, well, relatively speaking, uh, for sure not. Uh, and uh, we see growth in the US uh, and Asia in our uh, wealth management businesses, also in capital markets because of, of economic dynamics. Uh, in Asia, for historical reasons, we have been there for 50 years and we see growth coming through. In Europe, it's banks cannot grow. Wealth will not be created if there is no sustainable economic growth. So we are a wealth manager. So uh, net new money is coming in as a function mainly of share of wallet gains, not as a function in Europe of wealth creation. In Asia and the US, you have wealth creations. And therefore, you may capture market share uh, at the expense of competitors. But most importantly, you have your own clients who growth in their assets. Mary. I would just add, you know, you're, you're, you, a bank is no different than any other great company that's run in the world. You make great products and services for your clients, and you are the sum total of the history of what your clients ask for. And so the heritage of J.P. Morgan is to be the bank to the major governments and sovereign wealth funds and billionaires in the world. We don't have a choice as to which countries we want to be in. We have to be in the countries that our clients are in, and our clients move money around every day all around the world. So $5 trillion moves in and out of J.P. Morgan every day. And that requires us to be everywhere that our clients need us to be. And we're not going to be fair-weathered friends. We're going to be in these countries. We're going to be in these businesses. Whether they have high ROEs in one year or another year because of regulations or not has nothing to do with the long-term nature of us being there for our clients. Yeah, on Russia, we have a very important debate. Some of my colleagues say in five, 10 years, there will be no banks. We want to be a technological company. Alipay has 400 million clients, more than a any bank in the world. So no more banking in traditional way, no matter whether it's wealth management or whatever. We are a high-tech company. In a few years' time, we should stick to high technology, and that's it. I think it's a little bit uh, um, too much, I think. I still believe that uh, we should use high technology, definitely. We should use it more and more. But still, you know, to assess the risk, to manage the risk, that's something which the bank should do. And uh, so this, this would be a very high-tech model of new banking, but, uh, but still, still major functions so we'll keep. Antonio, let's br bring you in on this, if I can, uh, and, get, and let's expand on this whole idea of fintech and see if we can just come away with some, some real clear signposting as to what's going to happen here. I think the financial sector is incredibly flexible and has been really good at absorbing challenges over the years and reshaping and reinventing itself. So is, is fintech actually just nothing more than another technology cycle where the banks go, yeah, that looks kind of interesting. I quite like the way I can you know, buy a credit card company that just uses a chip to wave it over a payment device. We'll just buy them and absorb them. Is that ultimately what happens in this FinTech story, that the banks just become a bit more technically savvy, that our, your customers just engage with that as they would naturally do with any evolution in the way their account is managed? Well, that's another great question. And I think 
I think that obviously, as we just said, everybody said, banks have to concentrate where they have comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. So every business model is reasonable as long as it concentrates where the banks are good at, mm -hmm. and it is a coherent strategy. In our case, we have decided to focus Lloyds in the UK and in retail and commercial banking with a low risk profile and the lowest cost to income. And to your point, and now looking at the future, I think it is a complete revolution. So I would not see it as just a tech app or a, a innovation. It is, in my view, a revolution. We have embraced digitally more than three and a half years ago by creating a digital division at the top of the bank, at group executive committee level, because we wanted to fully embrace digital and fully digitize the bank. It will be a surprise to you. We now sell more products we fulfill more of our client needs on digital, on the phone, that we do through all other channels of the bank, when five years ago we had zero mobile customers. And therefore, I see this as a fundamental shift. And if banks don't embrace it, I think they will be in severe problems in terms of cost structure. Mm -hmm. So what to do with distribution networks, mm -hmm. how to be able to improve your customer experience as you digitize end-to-end -end processes, giving the customer a much better experience and at the same time, given you simplify the process, you lower your costs tremendously, I think is the way for a retail and commercial bank just, um, in the future. I mean, just, just if, if anybody's in any doubt here, Brian, just remind us um, what it costs you to ship coins and cash around within the business. And if you could just get rid of that cost, what would that add back into the bottom line? It's about uh, $5 billion a year of cost of move paper, currency, coins, checks, and all the stuff. And yet, it keeps coming down, but it's still big. And I, I think everything Rachel said is right, but the, the thing that is changing for the consumer business and, and banking is, so on a given day, people deposit checks by taking pictures of the phone in the United States, and that has the same activity as 900 branches that have. So just noodle on that a second. And so, and that's gone from zero four years ago to that level. So. So what causes that? It's not the idea of a digital image. We've been doing it at the ATMs. You could go in and do a digital image. It was the ability to distribute computer computational power in a phone and the always-on intimacy of it and the, and, the, and the willingness to use it. And so that has changed. And so that ability for us to help the unbanked become banked, to help people manage their finances better, to help people know where they stand, to help people warn them that their balance is low, to help them buy products, it, it, that is far different than what people think it is. And so where it leads, the customers will lead us. Um, but all the themes that Horatio talked about um, are unpredictable because that is wholly different than having to sit down at a computer and open it up and log in that you had to do up until you know, eight, 10 years ago. And then the power of those phones and the, uh, the acceptability. Look out there, people are on their phones. That would have been a different age if people had picked up a receiver and called out in the middle of a meeting. Mm -hmm. They would have been thrown out. And so the ability to be that contact is unbelievable. So think about that. And that mm -hmm. goes on, and that, whether it's wealthy clients or mass markets, it's wild. Um, you know, there are a lot of people here um, walking around saying, you guys are dinosaurs, right? <laughs> um, and that blockchain is going to change the world and ultimately what evolves from blockchain is a, a system of moving money around and paying for things that doesn't involve traditional banks at all. Do you think that's ever going to happen? No, we're not dinosaurs. And yes, things like distributed ledgers like blockchain will have a big impact on the business. But so did the SWIFT system many years ago. So did the ATM system. And but, so, but you're not frightened. You're yeah. just going to absorb these these new challenges, and great blockchain will be part of the Bank of America. There's a great offering. technology investor sitting in the front row. We, we, we spend $3 billion a year on pure code development in our company. Yeah. Ask him how many companies he had had an operating budget of $3 billion a year. I mean, we, you know, and by the way, all these, it, yeah. so there's just massive amounts of spending. And we, by the way, we partner to get it from other people who are spending hundreds of billions of dollars in their tech development, whether they're big companies or small companies. So I, these things will always change, but you know, if you, we were sitting there 20 years ago, it would have been computer, or 25 years ago, computer banking. When I was in high school, it would have been an ATM. The ability to get cash out of the machine was pretty neat. You know, but but, but, but you, you go back, and uh, I mean, absolutely, we can't be complacent about technology yeah. and fintech, but having said that, you go back 30, 40 years, our industry was the biggest user of technology. And if you look at the evolution, evolution of how we are using technology in our day-to-day -day business. It's quite remarkable the way we invest and we keep up to the needs of our clients. I'm always puzzled when I see 
hear people that say, well, we're going to be a technology company. or Because honestly, they have a diff totally different approach and, and, and businesses. We're going to continue to be a big user of technology. That doesn't mean that you are a technology company. And actually, you should never be a technology company. But uh, so the focus has to really be also in understanding that, uh, you know, for example, all this regulation is so is becoming so complex that it's no other way for us to embrace technology, in order to make it easier for artificial through artificial intelligence, mm. uh, for example, to manage compliance and uh, and very complex uh, uh, rules and, and and things that you know you wouldn't be able well, to well, absorb. Let, let, let me jump in a bit and let's just sharpen that up. I know that you have said that maybe we're looking to a future for a super bank that takes care of back office operations. I mean, maybe that's something that can be shared by competing organizations. Uh, uh, has to be, has to be, because this is very much what every single other industry outside banking has been having to address and going through in uh, post the industrial revolution as they needed to change their business model. They had to embrace, and by the way, banks, look at stock exchange and clearing houses and so on. Back 30, 40, 50 years ago in history, they were co-using utility-alike concepts. Mm. Then, of course, then people decided that it's better to give it back to private, do IPOs, and, mm. and do short-term gains. But in effect, you know, the, the notion of sharing infrastructure in the banking industry, industry is nothing new. We need to re-embrace it. Yeah. And, and, and we need to make it part of, of, of uh, um, of, 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 of the way to operate. So, uh, so would you do it with Credit Suisse? I mean, how no, far but, are but, we? But, with anybody. It has nothing to do with a single bank. Actually, critical mass uh, is important to create quality of service, ability to reinvest in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in these technology developments, and also to fence off potential new competitors. By the way, those new competitors, uh, as and Andre uh, just mentioned before, I hope one day or the other, and I understand why it's not the case today, they're also going to be faced with having to ask for a banking license if they do banking. And then absorb everything that comes with, mm. with being a bank. Jeff, Jeff, did you see this cartoon uh, that uh, Davos in 2050, whatever, all robots sitting here and all robots sitting there. <laughs> that's Davos. I mean, that's what we can expect now. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. No well, job. Well, 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 no while, job. While we're on the subject of robots, so Mary, can I bring you in here? Because you know, um, one of the one of the noises in the asset management industry has has been about the asset allocation decision being taken over by robots somehow, as though you can have a very sophisticated sort of cookie cutter approach to. Um, building a pension fund just by punching in some buttons and saying, well, this is my risk profile. Uh, now give me a bespoke solution to how I should uh, organize my portfolio. Um, is this just nonsense, or uh, is this really going to happen? No, I mean, there's, there's, there's great utility to it if you think about all the work that banks have done to, to deal with the unbanked. Think about all the people in the world that are the uninvested, right? They start their first job. They're not focused on their retirement. We all know that if you start early in your life and you, and you compound those assets, that you have a better chance for, for a healthier retirement. So if a robot will get you to do that because you're a millennial that doesn't want to talk to anybody and you just want to like play with your computer all day long, if you could do it on the computer, yeah. God bless. And at least you'll get some money invested. The, the problem is, is that a robot is going to have a really hard time talking to you and convincing you not to take your money out in the times of crisis. And that's the time where we all know mm. that it's the most important time that you, need, that you need advice. So I think that there's a lot to the robo nature of things. I think it's going to help a vast, vast swaths of people. But it's not the answer uh, for, for everybody. And it's not the answer through, through tough times. I just want to uh, finalize on the, on the fintech conversation. The, everyone thinks of fintech as the exciting new growth opportunity, ways to do things. It is just as important, if not more important, on the cyber front. And all of us mm -hmm. worry greatly about the safety and security of the assets of our yeah. clients. And our clients all rely on us to be, to be dealing with that. And so when you think about the cyber attacks that happen to our companies, we get 5,000 of them every minute mm. uh, inside of our bank. You expect us to have those fronts. And you expect us to make sure not only are we protecting the cyber 
protections on your asset, but also the data privacy, everything we know about you, the usage of it, whether we're selling your data out to somebody else. So they can, and so all of those things become a very, very important part of the dialogue that we should be having around digital. Uh, that's where we spend the bulk of our, uh, of our money. Well, well, it's been a great 59 minutes. Let's, let's just close here. I want to leave the audience with something that they can meaningfully take away. So, Mary, let me ask you, you you've got a number of banks here that operate in different geographies, in different markets. Which one of these guys' stocks do you actually want to own for 2017? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as head of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, we do not buy J.P. Morgan stock. So I would start with uh, buying the U.S. banks uh, as my short-term nature, and, and Bank of America would be the first one. Um, but for my uh, medium term, for my children's education, I'd be buying the European uh, banks, and then for my retirement plan with great. <laughs> it's a deal. It's I a deal. Buy the it's a deal. Very diplomatic. So. So, you know, there is a right to reply, and I don't want to appear sort of gender sexist or anything like that. So anybody on the panel want to say that they're putting J.P. Morgan in their private pension at the moment, just so that we reflect a, a, a balanced opinion? It's a great bank. It's a great bank. Very well managed. It's hard to match such a diplomatic response. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to have to, to move to the final wrap-up here. I just have one last question, and that really is a, a, a sort of um, uh, Rubini-esque black swan, grey swan. You know what? The Italian banks, still unresolved issues, trillion euros worth of NPLs. <coughs> Anybody on the panel here want to put up a hand and just offer one grey or one black swan potentially for the next 24 months? Brian? Well, uh, Mary mentioned earlier, you know, the... Cybersecurity geopolitical mix is, is something we just you just have to be ready for every hour and so I, I, it'd be characterized as a black swan would act like you don't expect it to happen it happens all the time but the ramifications are black swanish. Okay, I don't see too many other hands. No, going I, I think this is more a convergence of many factors yeah. that can really create a, a, a black swan event. A single event on its own is quite it's quite difficult, but a convergence of issues. Well, I guess we'll just have to watch Mr. Trump's Twitter feed closely to, for some guidance. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much to our panel. If we could just give our applause to them. And thank you very much, everybody, for watching on CNBC. Thank you. Thank you.